Swing, high fly ball! Built to right center, and the Braves have won it! This is the Fox Sports South Chopcast. Welcome to the show! For the last time in the 2017 season, this is the Chopcast, Chipcast edition, Corey McCartney. I'm getting a little wistful here as we welcome in Braves play-by-play voice, Chip Carey. Chip, what's a good word for Miami for this final series of the season? Well, it's raining outside and there's a roof on Marlins Park. That's two bits of good news, so that's uh, that's one way to start the show. And I'm really bummed out. This is the last time we'll chat until next spring. We were just getting to a rhythm. So, that's right. uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's been an interesting year to say the least. A lot of good times and uh, a lot of good things to look forward to in 2018. Well, an interesting storyline to these final days for the Braves. Ari Dickey told Brian Snicker he's passing on the start, the final start of the the season uh, for Sunday's finale. Max Fried instead getting the ball. So that sets up this scenario: four of the last five starts belong to rookies. We've already seen Sean Newcomb, Luis Gohara, Lucas Sims, and then Max Freed. Could there be a more fitting finish to 2017, a season that was set up to have veteran arms that ultimately stepped aside for youth, and we have a veteran arm stepping aside for youth? Yeah, that part of the plans worked out pretty well, albeit in a way that I don't think we expected. We, nobody expected Bartolo to struggle like he had here, and nobody expected Jaime to be just kind of eh as a, a starter and later traded away. But, no, this is exciting. Um, we, look, we know that the Braves have tons of young pitching. We know that they've stockpiled up through the system. We know that these guys are, are uh, winning and losing here at the major league level. More importantly, Corey, they're buying innings for these guys. Uh, these are experiences that can't be duplicated at AAA. They can't be duplicated throwing in the side. Uh, they're facing big league hitters, in some cases big league hitters who have playoff aspirations. And in the case of Giancarlo Stanton chasing down a a huge major league milestone to get to 60 home runs, something four other guys have only done uh, in the history of the game. Uh, that's really important for them. And uh, I think by and large, uh, over the last couple of weeks, they've done a pretty good job. Um, you know, there are some speed bumps along the way, as you'd expect. But uh, the, the upside of these guys is all very, very good. And uh, it's that's one of the treats this time of year when you're not going anywhere but home at the end of game 162. You look back and reflect on what these kids have done, and that's uh, that's been pretty impressive. You mentioned Jaime Garcia. So it, the Twins and the Yankees both go into the, the, the postseason. If, if either of those two teams gets this done, does he get a ring? Uh, yeah, if they get a World Series, if yeah, if he pitches, if he was on the roster and pitched one game for him, yeah, he would get a ring. Wonder, the, the question is, will he get a playoff share from both places? That's the real question. How about that? That's called <laughs> it's, that's called hedging your bets, right? When you, yeah. when you made an appearance for two different playoff teams in the same year. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's good for him. Uh, look, you know, Jaime was a nice guy. He just didn't pitch particularly well or consistently here. Uh, and it was obvious the Braves weren't going to resign him. What's interesting to me is what the Twins did. Yeah. They got Jaime Garcia. He made a start. They shipped him to the Yankees. They were four and a half, five and a half out in the wild card. They traded their closer, Brandon Kinsler, to Washington. And all of a sudden they got hot and they made the playoffs. So uh, first team to lose 100 games one year, make the playoffs the next. Uh, I think that's a, a cautionary tale for all of us and how quickly things can turn around from one season to the next. And uh, you've got to tip your cap to Paul Molitor in their front office. They they did an excellent job, like the Braves. A lot of young players finally began to blossom, and it all clicked at one time for them. And uh, the Twins have a chance to be a dangerous team if they can find a way to win a game in New York, which has been real tough for them, historically speaking. A 250 winning percentage against the Yankees since 2001. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, especially on the road. They just don't play well in the Bronx. They don't play well against the AL East in any of those ballparks. But uh, it's a great story. And as I said, uh, that's where the Braves want to go. Uh, they, they hope to make incremental leaps this year uh, as far as the record's concerned. Yeah, a little bit of a bump over last year. Uh, but I think the improved play of some of their youngsters is going to be the highlight of this year with uh, so many of these guys getting a chance to pitch up here and making the jump from the majors to the major league, or from the minors to the major leagues, if I your pardon. So we spent some time last week talking about R.A. Dickey and the value he brought to this rotation, what he could bring if the, in 2018 that the Braves were to bring him back, the first knuckleball Cy Young winner, an all-star gold glove winner. If we have seen the last of Dickey, uh, even if it's not in a Braves uniform, is that the definition, definition of his career to you, that he elevated the knuckleball in the modern era? Yeah, I think so, and I, I think persistence. I mean, remember, this is a guy that wasn't an knuckleball pitcher. Uh, Ari Dickey was a standard four-pitch pitcher when he was drafted out of Tennessee, and then they found out he didn't have the elbow ligament, and didn't pitch well, and had to uh, uh, had to figure out how to survive. And I think that's the word I would use for him. He's a survivor in so many ways. Everyone knows his personal history. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think his professional history certainly is a testament to that. 
And uh, the job he did for the Braves this year was was uh, extremely important. He did exactly what Atlanta needed him to do. Pitch 180 or so innings, get to double-digit wins, make all of his starts, and be a professional presence in the locker room. And uh, for that, I think the Braves should be and will be eternally grateful to R.A. Dickey. And at this stage in his life and his career, he's earned the right to decide whether he wants to pitch another game here or pitch another game somewhere else. And uh, it says a lot about the character of a man whose heart may or may not be in it all, all uh, 100 percent to be willing to walk away from eight million bucks and that's uh, the decision he and his family are going to make and whatever he chooses to do i think everybody in braves country ought to applaud him for it and be thankful so from what you've seen from the young arms how would you piece together a starting five from what we the braves currently have Huh, from what they currently have, well, I'll preface that by saying I really do believe the Braves need to go out and find a, 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 another workhorse starting pitcher, and maybe two of them. And remember, they had to have three of them uh, at the start of this season with Cologne, Garcia, and Ari Dickey, and two of them faltered, and then you had to rush some guys up to the to the major leagues. Uh, I'm assuming that Julio Teran will be back if he if he is. Uh, he's going to be in the rotation. Mike fulton certainly is going to be in the rotation uh, after a real up and down year for him. Uh, and then after that, I think it's really a, you know, roll of the dice. Um, you know, these guys have all shown signs of being very effective pitchers, but Tom Glavin made a point on our broadcast the other day, just because you get to the big leagues doesn't mean you're a major league pitcher. And he means that I believe with all due great respect, it's an incredible accomplishment to get here, but until they figure things out, it takes time. It's going to take a couple of years for these guys to, to work their way through. And in case, and that's Mike fulton I mean, this was really his first full year as a major league starting pitcher. And we saw the, the uh, stratospheric highs and the cataclysmic lows from Mike at times during the season. We're going to go through that next year with a lot of these guys, whether it's Gohara or Newcomb or Sims or anybody else. Uh, that's why having that uh, veteran guy who can, uh, be the mother duckling as it were is going to be so very important in my opinion now whether the Braves are willing to uh, cough up the money or the prospects to go do that uh, remains to be seen that's a call for the front office but uh, I think it's um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to win I think with young starting and untested starting pitching at this level on a consistent basis and uh, that number one and number two at the top of the rotation I think would really really help uh, ease that transition from a, a veteran team uh, and, and a hopeful team to a competitive one as soon as next year. So a milestone week for Ender, in, uh, for Ender and Ciarte, of course, gave the Braves their first 200-hit season since Marquise Grissom in 96. It came in New York, where last year, of course, he had his catch of the year entry in Robbie Yuenna Cespedes of a home run. When you consider Ender and what he's gotten done in New York, it certainly looks like the, they have another Mets killer on their hands. Yeah, they, he's uh, he's been terrific. Uh, great guy. He's had a great year. He plays every day. Uh, gold glove caliber center fielder. And I think that's the other exciting thing to think about is uh, look at where the Braves are going to be defensively next year with Ender in center, Dansby at short, uh, and, and Ozzy Albies at second base. Uh, pretty strong uh, trio right there up the middle. Uh, Flowers and Suzuki have done an excellent job uh, at the plate and, and at times behind it as well. So the middle of the Braves' defensive backbone should be pretty good. Uh, ground balls that weren't caught early in the season are starting to get caught, which is nice. And, uh, yeah, Ender's a big part of that. Uh, he's had a great year. And who knows, maybe he can get hot over these last three days and somehow catch Charlie Blackman for the hits lead. As part of our Baseball Writers Association of America duties, we have to vote for the Brave of the Year. And the votes came down this year to Enciarte and Freddie Freeman. If you had a say, who would be your pick? I'd be in CRT. Uh, with all due respect to Freddie, uh, he got hurt. That wasn't his fault. Um, you know, he had a great year, and the, the tragedy of the year for Freddie was uh, he got hurt right before the Braves were supposed to see the Angels, and Mike Trout, who also got yeah. hurt. And everybody in baseball talks about Mike Trout, the best player in the game, and I'm not here to argue that. But if you stacked up Freddie Freeman's numbers at the time of his injury, they were right there with Mike Trout, so nobody was talking about him in that regard. So uh, I would say Ender and Ciarte with a uh, slight asterisk to Freddie Freeman in second place only because Freeman got hurt. Uh, those two guys are going to be mainstays here for a long time, and hopefully uh, hopefully the Braves will get good pretty quickly so that we can enjoy the fruits of uh, the prime years of their major league careers. It is interesting. I, I did vote for Ender, but the thing I find really intriguing is if you, if you were to truly define 2017 for the Braves, it's about Freddie's injury, and it's about what he did when he came back. I think those are the two biggest mm-hmm. things is, is, is getting hurt and then coming back and saying, yeah, I'll, I'll slide over and play third base and keep Matt Adams in the rotation in the lineup yeah he was a pro uh and is a pro and yes it was kind of a let's let's see uh 
let's see if this would work. I mean, there aren't too many players of his stature that would be willing to put his career at risk, his reputation at risk, and his numbers at risk to do something for the greater good of the team. So, yeah, that was a that was a very selfless move by Freddie Freeman. Ultimately, it didn't work. And uh, you mentioned Matt Adams. The job he did in Freddie's place was absolutely remarkable uh, when the Braves got him for a, a bag of baseballs just about from the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, you know, they've got to decide what uh, and how Matt Adams fits on this team. And uh, hopefully there's a way to make this work. But uh, my gut tells me that uh, Matt's going to probably have to play someplace else because he's not an outfeeder. He's not going to play first base here. And he's too valuable a player to get one at bat a game. So whatever contributions Matt Adams made as a Brave, I hope people enjoy that and understand uh, what a great teammate he was too. Yeah, a lot of Matt's and a lot of Adams that they're going to have to get things yeah. like that with this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no right. question. So what's the first thing that Chip Carey does when the offseason hits? Is there a ritual? Uh, well, I go home and uh, try to reintroduce myself to my family. And, uh, you know, we have our baseball family, and we're all grateful for the folks at Fox and the wonderful job they do for us and with us covering these games. Uh, but the, the job is tough. The, the hardest part is, is uh, the, the leaving at the beginning of a season and knowing you're not going to see your family for the most part for six months. And the hardest part other than that is the reintroduction because there's a, a formula and everything that's uh, been handled very, very uh, effectively without you being there. Uh, so I just try to go home and not get in the way. Uh, hang out with my, my little guys and my, my high school seniors, and uh, we've got lacrosse games and refurbishing a house and unpacking groceries and getting the, 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 the clothes ironed into the dry cleaners, just kind of settle into a normal life and do what normal people do for uh, uh, 52 days or uh, 52 weeks out of the year. Uh, we have a great life. It's a different life, and uh, it truly is a, uh, uh, shall we say, a, a readjustment to get back to normal life when uh, game 162 is over, but we're all looking forward to it, I think, at this time of year. Yep, you're that much closer to not being in the way so that's a that's a good feeling yeah. that, so. <laughs> i do my best but i don't do it very well because uh i'm kind of a hands-on guy but uh uh you know life's good looking forward to getting home and then uh you know about three weeks later we all start getting the itch watching the playoffs and relaxing a little bit and then thinking ahead to 2018 which is going to be right around the corner i think we're 135 days or so until pitchers and catchers report so uh so there you go all right, the series against the Marlins continues tonight with Braves Live starting at 6.30, then Saturday at 6.30, and it all wraps Sunday at 2.30. All those are on Fox Sports South. And don't forget, you can catch myself and Zach Diller Chopcast live after the postgame show on Sunday. We're joined, joined by Braves GM John Coppolella and SI.com's Jay Jaffe. Chip, it's been a pleasure all season long. I can't wait to get things figured out on your exit velocity at the, after the final game on Sunday. Oh, it's good. You'll hear it. You'll hear the sonic boom. It'll be. I'll be headed out of town on Monday. But uh, thanks to you, Corey. Thanks to everybody in Braves country for a, a wonderfully supportive year. Joe and I appreciate it more than we can say in this uh, brief forum. But uh, we're we're eager and eagerly anticipating a better 2018 and many many more years to come.